Montauk, New York, located on the slender tip of Long Island, has long been known as an isolated fishing and resort community. Throughout its history, Montauk has experienced various periods of growth and development which have altered the landscape and greatly affected the lifestyles of long-time residents. The first major period of growth occurred in the mid-1920s when the developer of Miami Beach, Florida, Carl Fisher, discovered this beachfront paradise. Fisher established the Montauk Beach Development Corporation and transformed Montauk into a seasonal mecca for the wealthy. He built exclusive resort accommodations including the Montauk Manor, the Yacht Club, the Surf Club, and the Island Club. In addition, Fisher envisioned a new village center on the ocean side of Fort Pond and constructed a seven-story office building to crown his new main street. The residents of this small community, most of whom lived in the fishing village on Fort Pond Bay, could only watch the rapid phase of development transpire around them. The stock market crash of 1929 proved to be devastating for the development plans of Carl Fisher's Montauk Beach Development Corporation. Nevertheless, throughout the 1930s, Montauk sustained its exclusive resort reputation and locals continued to live quiet lives in their waterfront neighborhood. But the peace and quiet could not last forever. By 1942, world events had escalated into war and no corner of the globe was left unaffected. Before Congress, President Roosevelt called upon America to accept the challenge of war. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. February 1942, residents of Montauk make the ultimate sacrifice for the war effort. Families pull together and rush to evacuate their waterfront village on Fort Fun Bay for the sake of victory. Why, you may ask? Well, this small fishing village is located in a strategic and isolated location, ideal for top-secret naval activity. Fishermen who use this bay as a harbor for their boats have been relocated to Lake Montauk, and residents here are not leaving anything behind, not even their houses. This is one little town making a big difference. Remember the feeling people had of losing that way of life, of life on the beach? How they felt about having been displaced, so yes. to speak. I think a lot of people had a real feel for living close to the water, and uh, mm -hmm. their, their boat was on a mooring up that they could look out the window and see. Mm -hmm. I remember the post office was there, and uh, mm -hmm. that was moved up here, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So it was somewhat traumatic. I think that they felt I just keep trying to get rid of the fallacy that the fishing village was wiped out in the hurricane of 38. Our house floated, it had about three feet of water in it, it floated toward the road. Yeah. And uh, it was moved back. And then when I was 18, I, went, I joined the Navy. And while I was in boot camp, they got their notice from the uh, railroad. Long Island Railroad owned all that property. Mm -hmm. That the property was going to the uh, Navy, and that's when the fishing village ended. I'd say less than a quarter of the people moved after the hurricane. We lived in a fishing village until 1942, when the Navy bought the property down there or confiscated the property. 
Uh, the people didn't in the fishing village didn't own their property. Right. In that central area of the fishing village anyway. You were on leased land uh, from the railroad. Right. You had an annual lease. So you didn't have any negotiation with the Navy or with the government. They just told them that the, the railroad property we wanted. And the railroad just said everybody has to be out. The terms were the lease could be uh, terminated by either party on 30 days notice. And that's exactly what the people in the fishing village got. And, and when I came home from boot camp, they hadn't even thought of it when I left. When I came home from boot camp, well, it was two or three months later, the house was moved. Uh, they, the highway crew, the, the foreman, Dan Woodrow, lived right next door to us. And they put skids under and towed it around over the hill. And now it's down in Murder Hollow there by the Mount Target. I think they got a couple cases of beer and <laughs> towed it over. And uh, for this day, anything you dropped in one end of the house went to the other because it's <laughs> an angle that about five degree angle from the one end to the other. And that's the way they left it. It was kind of a dynamic uh, situation. So a couple of home house movers came in and they actually had, they actually parked homes down near where the Blue Marlin is now and down near where the firehouse is now and got them off the property until the people could get lots or locations someplace to replace them. Uh, my family moved two pieces of three buildings off the property. There was Trails End Restaurant, right. which is now located on the corner of Euclid Avenue and uh, Edgemere. Sure. And there was the home, there was a house behind, there was a building behind, which we used as a home behind Trails End now, it still exists as it did then, those two buildings. And then my mother had purchased a home that was in the fishing village. That was moved up to around in Delray in the Shepherd's Neck area. Residents of Montauk knew they were abandoning a way of life that would never be recovered. As many dwellings were moved to various places in Montauk, the village center also was relocated to the ocean side of Fort Palm. Though the Navy was just starting to prepare their move into Montauk, military presence in the area was already substantial. Only a few miles west of the lighthouse, an army base of immense proportions was already under construction. Montauk was a very busy, hustling place because the first project they built was the Fort Hero project where the coastal guns were. Yeah. And then there were a lot of construction people around. And then shortly after that, they, they built the Montauk uh, Torpedo Testing Range, the Navy Park Torpedo Testing Range. The two were not affiliated. No, at all. and also they increased the Coast Guard facilities out here at the lifeguard stations. And there were a lot of military people in Montauk and East Hampton Town. Much of the early military presence in the area was centered at Camp Hero. The base was part of the defense system organized to protect industrialized coastal cities from the threat posed by the enemy forces at sea. Planning for this top secret facility may have started as early as 1940. However, construction was not completed until June of 1943. The fort was disguised to look like a sleepy fishing village on the bluffs. Nevertheless, it housed two 16-inch naval guns observation posts, and massive underground ammunition bunkers which formed the heart of the base. There was nobody in Montauk that really had the facility or the ability to build something of that nature, but they did hire a lot of local people. My uncle, I worked for a, a contractor there. He was a rod man on the surveying group, the ones who were cutting, you know, cutting lines through and walking through and holding up sticks was uh, back in 1942 you didn't have the automatic electronic and digital equipment that you have today to do the surveying. After the construction phase of building all these things then you had the then you had the military moving in to, to operate them so Montauk had a lot of activity. I can remember when when the army started to come there would be <coughs> lines and lines and lines of trucks coming into Montauk. Oh yeah. With the guns, the big artillery guns that were put mm -hmm. into the Fort Camp Hero, mm -hmm. into, into the uh, dunes out there, the bunkers. They, every, all that was brought in by truck. Yeah, yeah. And of course, not too many people had cars, so it wasn't really a big thing to the people mm -hmm. going anywhere. 
you knew what time that they were coming in, you weren't moving for a couple of hours. <laughs> right. It's like being stuck with and the we freight had, train. Oh, during yeah. that period of time, we had blackouts. Mm -hmm. You had to put black curtains on your windows. Mm -hmm. And we also had um, our fathers would take time and go to the schoolhouse, way up in the, the little dome up in the schoolhouse. Yeah, mm -hmm. civil, the, you know, the siren. civil defense. Civil that's defense. where it started. That's, yeah. that's where yeah. it started. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd watch for enemy planes. And they'd have um, field glasses. Mm -hmm. And at different, different spots in Montauk. I remember that spot because my father went there. Construction is nearing completion on the Navy Torpedo Testing Station in Montauk. The P.T. Cox Spearing Barrow Corporation was contracted to build the site and has since constructed several large warehouses, a two-story barracks and a seaplane hangar. Nearly 2,000 sailors are expected to be stationed here once peak activity is underway. Fort Pond Bay and Luck Island Sound will be used as a primary testing area by the Navy. So our boys in the Pacific can knock those jacks out with just one punch. And that, that is part of history because without that torpedo testing range, we may not have won the war. <clears throat> We had been at peace for so many years, we didn't keep our armament up. And our submarines were firing torpedoes at vessels, and they weren't sinking them. The torpedoes, a lot of them, acted like boomerangs. They would go out, turn around, and come right back after the guy that fired them. But I remember mostly at wartime, and uh, I remember when that when they would shoot those torpedoes, that was a torpedo testing station was what it was. And sometimes they would go awry, uh, and these were not loaded torpedoes, they were they were practicing for direction. Mm -hmm. And when it would go awry, you could hear this whoo, 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 all over town. And you could look out and see the, see the torpedoes going all in the wrong direction. Never hurting anybody, but that's that's what that base was all about. You could see these from from the Duryea house. Yes, that yes, had been moved by that. Too. That's right. Yeah. They used to fire them in in the bay and fire them right up the gut. You know, past West Point. Yeah. And and, uh, and Culloden and everything. These things were going up the cliffs. They were going into guys' garages. They had no warheads on them, but they couldn't get them to go straight. And they had a seaplane that would go out, drop a marker, then a PT boat would go out and, and put a diver down and, and bring this stuff up. But uh, we couldn't get them to go straight. Finally, this very gyroscope came out here and they straightened the whole thing out. Do you remember ever them going into hitting people's houses or structures? Which I'm going to call it. Uh, Oh, Harry yeah. Standard yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, had one go right into his garage. Where is this? Near Tuck Hill? Murder Hollow. Murder uh, Hill? Just beyond uh, the Montauk. There's oh. a hollow there. Mm -hmm. Yes. A bunch of fishing houses down in there. And did do... No, nobody got hurt. Nobody was there. No. No. But, uh, but it was pretty upsetting. <laughs> there was a monster barge out in the Fort Pond Bay. It was ship the torpedo in by rail, and the torpedo would be offloaded, transferred to a, a smallish boat, run out to the, the barge that had the launching equipment, and then when the situation was right and time was to, to launch the, the torpedo, and of course there would be a, a plane come out of the the old hangar, uh, generally a float plane. There would follow the torpedo as it was shot off the barge and determine whether it was running true and whether the gyros were set properly. If it was running true, it would be off to the fleet. If it was running erratically or doing this sort of thing, it would be shipped back for more adjustings. The Montauk Torpedo Testing Range was vital to the success of American naval vessels in both the Atlantic and Pacific. 
as battles to control the high seas reached epic proportions. In addition to the Army and Navy, there was another branch of the service stationed in Montauk that played a critical role in the defense of the home front. There was a large contingent of Coast Guard auxiliary boats out here, and those boats operated out of the Starham area, out of the Montauk Harbor area. Mm -hmm. These were boats that were basically yachts or prior sport fishing boats, who the people volunteered you know, to work for the Coast Guard and they would operate up and down the coast uh, looking for submarines. In 1942, the winter of 42 and 43, when we were, had to move up the, up the beach when the Navy came in, uh, my mother rented, which would now would be a very expensive rental, <laughs> uh, a house up on the old Montauk Highway that was right next to where the Surfside Inn is now. And uh, the Hither Plains Coast Guard Station, which does not exist any longer, that's across the street. Right. And all, in one of the larger homes right next to us, they had the Coast Guard people there. Uh -huh. And they had dogs in the back. They had the dogs, they had kennels in the back. Uh, because at night, when the Coast Guard people would walk the beaches, uh, they'd take the dogs on the beaches with them. See, the Coast Guard stations was every maybe five miles along here. They used to walk the beach between all these stations, see? You had Hither Plain had a Coast Guard oh, station yeah. that used to be there, and then the Ditch Plain had one, and then the lighthouse was next. But after Hither Plain, you had one to Napeak. But they'd meet from one way, and then when they met, they'd turn around and go back to their own station. And they, all these stations had maybe 20 or 30 men in them just to walk the beaches. Was in June of 42, is when the Germans put a sub, pulled a submarine yeah. on the beach in Amagansett and put four or five guys over in a life raft and put them ashore. Yeah. And the Coast Guard guy ran into them. In the right place at the right time, Coast Guard John Collins foiled Nazi invasion. On a routine patrol, this hero stumbled upon Nazi saboteurs coming ashore on the Napegu Beach. Their mission? To plant explosives in key industrial sites in and around New York City. Colin narrowly escaped his strange midnight encounter with the Nazis, who were pretending to be local fishermen. But our hero knew better. Colin played naive and accepted the bribe they offered him, only to hurry back to his station and report the event to his supervisors. Thanks to Colin, the FBI were able to track down the Germans and prevent a catastrophe. Another job well done by our boys on the home front. The Nazi landing on Napig highlighted the importance of a strong military presence in Montauk. The once sleepy fishing village but now transformed into a military hub. Say I was away for those years in the service, but I guess Montauk was a, a really active place. They, uh, the Navy came in, they took over the Montauk Manor as a housing place. They had the manor, they had the dormitory building behind the manor, which no longer exists. Right, they built that. They built the barracks. They built the barracks down below the manor, where, the, where they have the tennis courts now, and, and some private homes have been built down there. Mm -hmm. And then they built a medical facility. At the manor. At the manor, which was a building that was out, I don't know whether it was out where the Fort Hill Cemetery is now, or between the manor and the Fort Hill Cemetery, there was another building there. That was used as a, as a, it wasn't a big concrete structure, these were all frame structures, temporary frame structures that was built there that they used as a medical facility. And that was for the military? For the, for the Navy military. The Navy. And the Montauk, the, the tower building uh, was the uh, Bachelor BOQ, the Bachelor Officers Quarters. Uh -huh. That was that. And the, the tower building was just straight, you know, when it was there, when the Navy came in. See now, you know, on the west side of the building, you have that one or two-story affair that was built for the kitchens and you know, food facilities for the, for the 
where the tower, which was the, oh, what we call the office building at the time, where the tower building. I see. They uh, built a concrete road that goes, out, goes over now to uh, the new park, built a seaplane hangar there, but housed the small planes. And then all the buildings that were in Rough Riders, I mean, this, looking at Rough Riders now, we see the, the wooden condos, but before they were built, there was, there was vast warehouses there. It made quite a bit of difference because a lot of families moved into town. You know, a lot of Navy wives and a lot of sailors. I don't think we had a, <laughs> I don't think we ever had a black student in our school, probably until maybe until the Navy came in. Probably not. I don't remember ever going to school with anyone. No, we didn't. No. There was uh, not one one no. black person family in Montauk. The only black people we saw growing up were like the porters on the on the railroad train. Yeah. But there was never a family that I ever remember living in Montauk. During the war, the office building was used as a uh, quarters for the officers club. And then the officers training institute was Trails End, which was the bar and restaurant next door. And, um, <laughs> Some things never change in life. <laughs> I worked at Trails End during that time. Sailors, plenty. Plenty of sailors at Trails End. Dancing, dancing, dancing. You know, the dance floor was small, but they liked that. They had a wonderful time. They had a jukebox. Jukebox, playing around the clock. We had big bands that would come down here with the U.S.O. show. Oh, yeah, and they and came with the, at the old tennis court. They made a theater out of that building. It was really Absolutely very nice. Beautiful. They did a nice job in there. No, the, well, it was they the had a theater, court. then they had a great big dance hall. Oh, God, it was nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful The Navy place. did all that, because mm -hmm. all the... Their, the men were stationed up at the manor, you know. 2,000 sailors. That roof was all yeah. panes of glass. And I remember as a kid, I don't know that it was even used then, but some, it was vandalized to the point that every pane of glass was broken in that roof. And the Navy took it over, and they really fixed it up. It oh, was a beautiful nice. building. The mm. highlight was watching the sailors. Why go up? <laughs> Just watching them, period. Just <laughs> watching them go up to the manor because Uncle Lou <clears throat> lived in the firehouse then. Oh, that's right. And yeah. you could look out the living room window, and that's right where the yeah. stairs were. They'd go the up for lunch, up, for lunch, for lunch, and back. And down and no, and just you know. And we used to always manage to be standing out on the front lawn so somebody would whistle that. at you, though. You know, <laughs> they had stairs going on the side of the hill, right behind where the firehouse is now. They had stairs yeah, going up the side the of that. They built right up there. It was mm -hmm. nice. And and how many romances came out of that in Montauk? Were there well, quite a few romances? Eva had, Eva had a pretty good <laughs> Eva had a few good, <laughs> couple of them. Jeez. <laughs> well, didn't you? Yeah, it was pretty nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought she meant like permanent things. I think they were probably lucky. A lot well, of East Hampton girls. The war of the continues in Montauk. Local rally around the troops by participating in volunteer services. The Montauk branch of the American Women's Voluntary Service has received a Red Cross Award for record blood donations this week. Saving lives and looking beautiful doing it. Good work, ladies. In other local news, the Navy has refurnished the old Montauk indoor tennis court then transformed it into a USO dance hall and theater. Montauk and East Hampton women have had a key role in organizing entertainment and events for many servicemen stationed here. That playhouse was wonderful because they used to bring USO shows out there. Yeah. And I can remember dancing to Kay Kaiser's orchestra. And uh, they would bus girls in from Sag Harbor, East Hampton, so that the men and sailors, they were only like 18 and 19 years old. They were kids. Sure, you know? sure. Uh, so they could have a partner to dance. And they had two bands going at these dances. 
one band took a break and the other band would play. So they, you were dancing all the time. They showed movies there. And to get into the to go to the movies you had to be chaperoned by someone from service. So we had a connection with Bob Sylvester, who used to write for the Daily News after he got out of the service. He was stationed there. He would, he had rank. And he would wait at the main gate and and we would all go to the movies. That's wonderful. Yeah. The best movies you ever want to see, you know, <laughs> right up to date. They, yeah. they put the service men, they had yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hostesses are expected to be present at Navy Hall Tuesday, November 21st. Bingo will be introduced as a new USO program. The bingo prize will be a telephone call home. Informal dancing and refreshments will follow. Yeah, the people really got involved. I mean, they really were... Um... We knew a lot of these, I mean, you know, they were here, they were sailors, and then and they were all, they were all young like we were. We had quite an act of the USO down in, in our oh, church yeah. basement, too, oh, during yeah. the war. My mother was always there, and they'd, they'd go there and they'd bake, and, you know, they'd serve and all Mrs. the Cook fellas, and Mrs. Spaghetti's and Aunt Aggie and her yes. scrambled eggs, oh my God, yeah, they were they, good. <laughs> yeah, they, that was quite an active thing going. We were the annex to the USO, I think. Right? Yeah, really. I think we had our own little thing. <laughs> my mother, if my mother saw Sal on the street, she'd invite him in for dinner. <laughs> hey, how you about know. coming for a cup of tea, right? Yeah. But oh, in fact, they got so they used to come to the house in the afternoon, have cake and uh, pie and stuff. And there was, we were even met home. them all, you know, at, oh, at the USO and everything, and all yeah. young kids. So she, my mother used to have them at the house all the time. That's that Canadian hospitality. It really is. A set of twins that came from Tennessee. They had never seen snow before. A lot of them had never seen snow, because these kids came from all over the United States. And they would just have a wonderful time coming down those manor, the uh, steps down to the rec hall. Just <laughs> throw snowballs at one another and play in the snow. And they just did all like little kids. And then the next thing you know, they'd be shipped out. And you know where they were going. They were going to New York City to Pier 62 or something like that. Yes. And they'd get orders fast and they'd ship out. You'd never hear from them again. You know what happened, you know? Yeah. It was sad. That part was sad. Part was sad. As the world had come to Montauk, the men of Montauk were going off to the world. By land, on the sea, and in the skies, local men bravely fought in the spirit of their hometown. World War II, I was in high school, and uh, not old enough. No. And uh, I tried to get in, because everyone wanted uh, to get into the yeah, service. Yeah, to do your I share, mean, yeah. When Roosevelt got on that uh, radio and started blasting everybody uh, about how we were going to win the war, everybody wanted to. When I was in college, I spent the summers here, but I was a World War II baby in the pack. So we registered for the draft. And uh, when I did that, I sort of, you know, I don't want to be that way. I mean, I don't want to be stuck off in an army unit someplace in the wilderness. So the government, in its, in its wisdom, developed programs where a person in college could commit, we'll say, to aviation or to surface ships and, and continue in college so, uh, so that they would be protected and could finish school and then go into the, the military. So I chose flying and I started flying in college so that by the time I graduated, I had a, an instructor license. Instructor, there. Um Young men in the same program you were in? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and two sides of it, the ground school, which is more or less physics and, mm -hmm. and simpler stuff, and the actual flying. Did you see combat? Yes, With you? yes. What parts of the Pacific? You name it, and I'll... Every, yeah, every you were everywhere, huh? Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Saipan, Alulu, uh, 
Bee Gees. It wasn't a thing that we missed. Where were you stationed? Oh, I started out, I was working out of Greenport four years there in the Coast Guard, and I got put on a sailboat, and we used to go out and lay offshore for three weeks and just lay there with underwater sound gear. And, uh, Listening for submarines and what have you? They called it a picket patrol, and somewhere, maybe off of Nantucket, every so far, they had an area where a sailboat was laying with underwater sound. So if anyone wanted to get into New York, and they had a little couple of them went south a little in the Jersey coast. So New York Harbor was protected for anything, a submarine coming in. See? But that was after the Germans had already right. went to New York. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? We always... yeah. And uh, that's why we were there. We had uh, depth charges on deck. Of course, we was a sailboat, yeah. and if we ever threw one overboard, it was going to blow the stern off us because we didn't go fast enough to get to away get from it. <laughs> that, that would be in the last last, last emergency that you. I would don't know what it was for, but yeah. they could say they have depth charges, <laughs> and they said we had a machine gun and we had an air cooled 3030 from World War One. <laughs> What was you going to do with a 30-30? This, this was the stuff they said to, to ease people's minds, right? <laughs> yeah, well, well, the main thing was when the war ended, just before it ended, we picked up a German with one of the submarines they got. Ah. But there was a, wasn't much left of him. He had a life raft and uh, some bones. But, uh, oh, boy. And uh, we were lucky enough that he wasn't on our area. We was visiting one of the other boats, and we had to give it to them. And they had to strip him and they get his papers and then bury him at sea. So I told the gang on my watch, don't you guys see anything? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you look up in the air, don't look for nothing floating. We didn't want no more of those Adolfs we used to call them. The only other thing I gotta say, I brought the only English war bride back with me after World War II. <laughs> you met your wife in England? I met her there after the invasion. When we came back to England, waiting to come home. I only went out with her a few times, it was just letter writing. Then I was only home uh, a month on leave, and believe it or not, I was sent on landing barges for the invasion of Okinawa. And if they hadn't dropped those bombs, which I'm very happy they did, the next one would have been Japan, and I don't think I would have been given three chances. So no. I was just as happy they dropped them. BJ Day has finally arrived and our boys are coming home. There's not one piece of territory or one thing of a monetary nature that we want out of this war. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. In Montauk, the end of the war meant saying goodbye to newfound friends and waiting for loved ones to arrive home. Slowly, the military presence dissipated. By the end of February 1945, the last torpedo was fired in Fort Palm Bay. In March of the same year, the Montauk USO Club, whose hostesses volunteered a total of 26,569 hours, closed its doors after 16 months of service. Over 63 dances had been sponsored by the club and 185 motion pictures shown. As the demilitarization of Montauk continued, residents awaited the return of seasonal retreat seekers, beachgoers, and sports fishermen. The opening of the Montauk Manor in the summer of 1945 helped to initiate a renewed sense of hope for the future of Montauk. I was in the service from October 43 until January 46. I, in the summer of 46, I worked at the manor, driving a taxi cab. I went to college in 46 to 50. All through college, 
me. First year I drove, and then the next three years I managed the garage service, the storage garage service, and the taxi service out of Atlanta. It was good years. We, had, we worked hard. I mean, we really worked hard then. I'm sure. And it, the Island Club was operating then, and we were so very... was much demand for Well, oh, it was big demand. There were people had cars in 46. The main mode of transportation was the railroad. The railroad would come in and bring in all kinds of people in. And we would have to taxi them to the hotels and around, and, and then we'd have to transport them to the Yacht Club, and the Island Club was a big thing on Saturday nights. The Yacht Club was a big operation down there, people back and forth. So it was, a, it was busy during the summer. My parents uh, worked in the city, and early in the post-war era, era uh, were able to take their first vacation and came out for, I think, a week to uh, the Montauk Manor. And the reason they picked uh, the Montauk Manor, this must have been in 47 or 48, uh, was that uh, it was a very European uh, uh, place. It was uh, relatively formal. Uh, they had uh, afternoon tea. And I think you were dressed up on uh, Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. And there was dancing and formal dining, and, and they, uh, my, my parents were very European and liked the, uh, this type of atmosphere. In addition, uh, uh, right next to the uh, yacht club, there was uh, a place where there was gambling. While they were not gamblers, again, they liked, uh, it was relatively formal, they liked that kind of uh, an atmosphere, and they used to also visit all the casinos. And, Europe, I guess, uh, before the war. We used to get a lot of, you know, we used to get a lot of impressive people here. Yes, we and we, we really named people, mm -hmm. and Bill, some of the other people would come out here, and, uh, and they would go to the Island Club, they, they'd park their yachts in Montauk Lake, they would bring them in. If they couldn't get them in, they'd bigger, and they'd lay off the breakwater and come in from there. Mm -hmm. And they'd bring chauffeurs, and they'd bring some staff with them mm -hmm. sometime. And, so it, it, it wasn't as commercialized then. At the manor, when you were a guest at the manor, you had used the surf club, and they used to run a bus service from the manor to the, to the surf club all day long. And if you were a guest at the manor, uh, they, your food was, they had a buffet, they used to set up a buffet at the surf club, so you didn't have to go back to the manor for lunch. worked up there. I worked in the first office's dining room and finally got upgraded and uh, went into the main dining room and that's where I met all the, the movie stars and the oh. big wigs that came. Oh, yeah. I think when we were talking earlier you did mention Errol Flynn. Yeah, well, I did. I waited on him and he left a nickel. I didn't know that you had to wait till the end of the week to get your tips. Oh, I see. So, I mean, you know, he, he knew that, but I didn't. Mm. The money was pooled. So I picked up the tablecloth and shook it like this, and the nickel hit the floor and it stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally unexpected, right? <laughs> very, very. Club. They had the Yacht Club. They had the Island Club. Uh, this was all beside the fishing that was available. Mm -hmm. and, and all spun and it the all, beach. And all spun off the manor. The beach, the surf club. And, and everything spun off the manor, mm -hmm. except the fishing industry, which mm -hmm. you know, took care of it, uh, took care of itself. So uh, there was there, there was a lot, there was a lot going on in those days. Indeed, the fishing industry had no problem taking care of itself. The waters off Montauk supplied what seemed to be endless amounts of prize-winning catches. In November of 1946, it was announced that Goebel Aircraft Specialties Company would rent Navy warehouse space for the distribution of surplus aircraft parts. Though the Navy no longer occupied Fort Palm Bay, many fishermen hesitated to move back into their pre-war mooring plots. These previously displaced fishermen found the harbor in Lake Montauk convenient as it was closer to the fishing grounds and offered better shelter from harsh weather. Robert Gosman Sr., an East Hampton car salesman, recognized the increasing demand placed on Lake Montauk and decided to invest in the future of the harbor. He worked for Lester Motors. He was a salesman. And then, of course, the war came along. 
they're no more automobiles. So he had always been involved in Montauk and the fishing. He used to do what they call fish drumming. He'd buy the fish off the docks for certain companies in um, in New York and Manhattan. Fulton Fish Market. That was the big. That was the main fish processing area there. And then eventually he leased the dock from Charlie Bonner, who was the owner of the dock, who leased it to Esso because there was a gas dock there too. So it was a blood lease. It was leased from Charlie to Esso and back to my father. And commercial boats came in, as well as charter boats and private boats. A lot of private boats came in, big, beautiful boats. Mm. Then, of course, for the fishermen, the commercial fishermen, they shipped fish out of there. Mm. They had ice and then all the things they needed and so on. And then he had a little store down there where they could buy razor blades and a toothpaste and a few canned groceries, and cigars, cigarettes, beer, all that kind of thing. You know, yeah, it was quite a place. They had a pot-bellied stove in the middle of it. And of course, all the all the fishermen would hang out there in the winter time. But what they weren't able to do was get a cup of coffee. Hence, the founding of the restaurant, because we built a shack there. I think in 1946, 44. 546. At that time, most of the business was morning business, heavy breakfast. I mean, they used to open at 3 o'clock and 2 or 3 o'clock sure, in the morning. Well, mm -hmm. the bar would be open, and then mm -hmm. after the bar closed, they all had enough to drink, and they'd come in and have breakfast. So they usually opened the lunch counter at 3 or 4 o'clock, because those fishing boats went out at, you know, 4, 5 o'clock, whatever. From entrepreneurs like Robert and Mary Godman to fishermen who have dedicated their lives to the sea, Montauk has had a long tradition of attracting adventures. One such adventurer who discovered Montauk early in the post-war era was pilot Margaret Potts. My husband and his brother George and Johnny had decided they wanted to do charter fishing. They had been fishing between Freeport and New Suffolk. Freeport for about near two-thirds of the season and New Suffolk for week fish and porgies, a six-week session. Of course, one would never think about the end of Long Island. I mean, that just never occurred to us. We, we knew nothing about it. So one day, I was asked whether I would fly some passengers over to East Hampton. I said, of course. So I flew to East Hampton, never having been to this section at all. And on the way going, I kept looking over there and saying, on the way going back, I'm going to explore a little bit. So I dropped my passenger off. I followed the ocean all the way over to the point, the lighthouse, and I looked things over. And I looked things over. So, along Westlake Drive, there were some potato fields. There were no houses there except, I think, two that looked like mansions to me. There's nothing on the other side of the lake. And I looked everywhere, and there was just this, what I called a gut, going from the sound water into the lake. And it was wonderful. And I looked things over and over and over and saw how little there was and how beautiful it was. And I went back, and when I saw George and John again, and they, I told them about Montauk, and they said, we've been told that the fishing is wonderful there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, check it. So we sold the land plane, and we got the seaplane. I used it for scouting and for taking people from Montauk to anywhere in New England, and to, mostly to Manhattan. And we'd sit down on the river at 23rd Street, and I'd wait. Mm -hmm. It was a good experience for me then. Not having a radio didn't matter. You just flew low over the water and, and the FAA wouldn't bother you and you wouldn't bother anyone. And it was wonderful to be able to fly under a bridge, over a bridge and so on, and no one say anything. Uh, these days, it's more strictly regulated. Newcomers have always been welcome in Montauk, whether to settle within the community or simply to enjoy the world-famous fishing for a weekend. Nevertheless, during the early days of a brewing Cold War, some visitors were not welcomed with open arms. Oh, and the Russians? Tell oh, about the yeah. Bush. I don't know. This was, uh, <laughs> I guess, af after the war, naturally. 
we had a group come Just on. Just after the war. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, Cold War was going on at the <laughs> time, huh? With uh, a group of Russians come on a boat. One spoke English. So we went fishing, you know, and they all had their own little satchel with their own little bottles of vodka. They all different, you know, each one had their own. We went fishing, came in, had a great day. It was a nice day. Next day, <laughs> and, uh, we used to get news day and they had a box out in front of the house. There was a note in there from the FBI. They said, they, who Want to make we? an appointment with us? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, oh. I don't know who we had fishing, where oh, yeah. we went, did they throw any bottles overboard with notes in them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how they knew they were there, but somebody they must sure? have known. You know, they wanted to know if we, uh, you know, what happened? What, what were they doing there? And uh, did they throw any <laughs> bottles overboard with notes in them? That was the main thing. <laughs> how they communicated oh, with the submarines? They they Evidently. <laughs> in the developing Cold War, Montauk would again be called into action. Although the Army had placed Camp Hero on inactive status in 1947, there were extensive plans for the future of this strategically located base. The first step in this plan was to renovate the facility, and in December 1948, the dismantling of the World War II 16-inch artillery guns signaled the beginning of this process. November 7, 1949. Though the future of Camp Hero is still pending, the issue of what will be done with the old torpedo testing range was finally settled today as Goval Aircraft buys the surplus naval base. Though Goval has rented space in these warehouses since the end of the war, with full ownership the company has decided to diversify the uses of the site. Though it will continue operation of war effort sales, Global plans to turn the site into a new sportsman's paradise. The dock will be repaired and several of the now vacant buildings will be transformed into Fish Angrilla, complete with restaurants a tackle shop, repair shop, and hotel accommodations for an excess of 300 people. Reception facilities will also be set up to welcome fishermen arriving by plane, motor, and the Long Island Railroad. What do you remember about Fish Angry Lot? <laughs> I remember the men coming out to fish Shangri-La on a train. It was a, a special train. Uh, they brought the fishermen out, and almost before the train would stop, they'd be piling out the windows and the doors to get their their spot, you know, and get their boat. Uh, they were they were in a frenzy. And uh, the fishermen special used to come out, and. Uh, these people in the city were so hungry to get out here and go fishing for relaxation. Uh, you're taking your life in your hands if you were on that dock and just wanted to stand there and look around when that train came in. The train wouldn't pull all the way to the station. It couldn't because then it killed God knows how many people. They were diving out the windows of the train and everything else rolling down those cinder thing, heading for the dock, get to that one favorite boat they want. The boats were tied up on a catwalk down below. They would throw their gear to the boat. Uh, there again, I mean, you could get hit by God knows what. And that went on. And uh, I got engaged down at the Shangri-La. Well, Old nice? Jack Craft sang Red Sails in the Sunset for her. You had a nice party there then, huh? Yes. Yeah, it was yes. nice. Yeah. All I remember about the Fish Angry Law was this huge room with a stage in it. Right. Where they could hold all kinds of events. Goebbels' efforts to make Fish Angry Law a sportsman's paradise were successful as streams of New Yorkers discovered outdoor recreation in Montauk. By the summer of 1950, docking space for a hundred fishing boats was completed. The site of the old fishing village was now the home of a fine seafood restaurant, two cocktail lounges, a 24-hour gas and diesel station, and a recreation hall called Liar's Lair.
brought in the first giant tuna. I remember that, that I know the date. It was September 1st, 1949. And the reason I know that was because that's when Steve was born. <laughs> <laughs> and Frank came to the hospital and he thought he was all excited about the first giant tuna. And I said, hey, wait a minute, I did something last night too. <laughs> I think the first giant tuna was born by Harry Alfandri on his boat, the Rosie. The Rosie. And he was the one that started, you know, the first giant tuna fishing. It's the first time we did it. At Rosie's Ledge. Rosie's and that's Ledge. why they called it Rosie's yeah. Ledge. Oh, because after the boat. But I think he was the first one. We didn't even know how to catch him. That boat went over there and lost a lot of tackle and other things. <laughs> did you go over for them too? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. The spreading news of the giant tuna off Montauk furthered the reputation and commercialization of fish angrela. As a result, the Goebel Corporation enticed the leaders of the United States Atlantic Tuna Tournament to put Montauk waters to the test. In the summer of 1950, the eighth annual Atlantic Tuna Tournament was held at Fish Angrela. 300 fishermen, 24 clubs, and 82 boats took part in the extravaganza. When we had the Atlantic Tuna Tournament at Montauk, the boats would go fishing over at Rosie's Ledge across the way, for the most part. And that was a sight to behold. I would take people over there from Montauk, Jack Kraft Sr. in particular. And we'd go there and you'd look down and it was just like a giant aquarium. You'd see these huge fish just zooming around all the, in between the boats and so on. And not that plentiful anymore. That was an area for the giant tuna. For the giant tuna. And um, it was a wonderful thing to see. Nobody objected to my low altitude at that time. Everybody wanted to see what was going on below, and the people down below were too busy with what was going on, so I didn't hear anything from the FAA at that time. The tournament was a success, giving Montauk new prestige as a sports fisherman's paradise. As a result, the charter fishing industry grew at an unprecedented rate. This sparked competition between charter boats and encouraged captains to use new techniques of finding record catches. Pilot Margaret Potts employed the method of spotting fish from the air for her husband, Captain George Potts. What I did with the seaplane, not the land plane, was to start in around 200 feet. And I found that depending on the condition of the water and the wind direction and so on, I could comfortably spot at 100 feet. At certain angles, the fish would become more apparent. And I could signal uh, George which direction to head and distance and so on. That's why he would get the first school tuna of the season because I'd be going out for several days and I'd see where they'd be coming in from and so on. Um, and well, we had signals. Either I'd flap the wings at certain times or wackle the rudder, nose up and down and so on. We had a signal for distance, direction, the direction the plane gave and what it was. Well, it was always we were looking for swordfish. Uh, unless it was, of course, looking for the first tuna fish, uh, small tuna, to come in. World events and military activity again threatened to disrupt Montauk's fishing tradition. On June 25, 1950, Communist North Korea invaded U.S.-supported South Korea. Shortly after, Camp Heroes again put on active duty as an Army anti-aircraft artillery training site. Some 30,000 yards of sea would be declared a danger area and kept clear of all cargo and fishing boats. Montauk residents were again asked to compromise their way of life as men who made their living from the sea were restricted from entering some of the area's most valuable fishing grounds. We used to have those anti-aircraft guns down there, the lighthouse there. They used to have practice, they used to tow targets and they used to fire from the beach, you know. Somebody would tow a target by or they'd have these uh, robot planes go by and they'd see if they could shoot them down. In fact, we couldn't even run through the area when we were going fishing. We had to go before 7 o'clock in the morning and come back after 5 or something like that. And if you wanted to uh, run just down the beach, 
there was a patrol boat in front of the lighthouse, and there was one, say, on Caswell's Point, you know, down there. That area you couldn't, you couldn't even get into. No, they wouldn't let you go in there, because if they have a misfire or something like that, you know, they'd plop right in where you're fishing. So we'd go offshore, we'd have to leave earlier and go offshore, get through the area before they start shooting, and we'd have to wait outside to come back. Yeah, that, they did that for quite a few years. In addition to the Army using Camp Hero as a training site, the United States Air Force 773rd Control and Warning Squadron also occupied the base in early 1951. As the first shots of the Cold War were being indirectly fired on the Korean Peninsula, Montauk was again a hub of military activity. I was into sport fishing, mating on boats, and uh, right after high school, I did that until uh, a thing uh, came along called the Korean Conflict. <laughs> yeah. Then I was called into the service. I was mm -hmm. in the Navy for four years. Did you end up going to Korea? <laughs> uh, made one trip to Korea, back to the States. Then they put me on a uh, guided missile test ship. And I spent the rest of my tour there in Port Wayne, California. We would go out and fire missiles during the day and come back at night. While war is again raging overseas, we face a different kind of tragedy at home. A party boat named the Pelican capsized off Montauk Point. It had been a disaster of immense proportions. Sixty-four boarded the vessel when it left Fish Shangri-La Dock, and only 19 were saved from the harsh waters beyond the lighthouse. I was involved in that too. I was home on my first leave. That was in 51, uh, Labor Day weekend. Yeah. And uh, Frank Tuma, old Frank Tuma was the chief of the fire department. Mm -hmm. He got wind that I was home and he called uh, the house and told my mother, he said, I hear Vinny's home. He said, we need him on uh, rescue the uh, So I went down. The boats at that time were down in Fort Pond Bay, and the uh, railroad used to bring the people out from Manhattan for, I don't know what the fee was, maybe two dollars or something like that, to go fishing. And they get climb on the boats, and uh, if there were, regardless of the number of people coming out, there was only so many boats. So, you know, the fellas getting off the train had to run to get on a boat, because when the boats got loaded, the, the captain would just push the boat off so they couldn't take any more. And then the fellows left on the dock had, you know, had to find some other way to fish, maybe fish off the dock. I guess they had uh, about 60 people on that thing. I don't know exactly. And it was a nice day. And uh, I was fishing at the time. We were going tuna fishing, but I was running out of the uh, yacht club at the time. And uh, George Glass was fishing over. He was bottom fishing over in uh, Block Island. And uh, it was a per perfectly flat time day. George got on the radio and said, gee, he says, you know, the wind's coming up a little bit. He says, about 10 or 15 northeast. Well, we weren't too far off, so maybe 15, 20 miles. So we started going to the west so we could have it, you know, maybe a little head on coming home. And uh, a little while later, about a half an hour later, he said, gee, he says, it's blowing about 20 or better now. He says, I think I'll go home. So we figured, well, we better go home too. And it was still flat calm. As we came in, I don't think we came in maybe five miles, and you could see the wind coming across the water. You know, it was getting all ripply. By the time we got back to the lighthouse, it was really blowing. It really blew up and, in a hurry, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, mm. and I came by the lighthouse with uh, the Pelican, Eddie uh, Carroll, yeah. captain. Oh, yeah, I remember We that. came around the lighthouse mm. together, and Captain Zeke, he was there too. Remember Captain Zeke? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we came around a point together. Eddie stopped at North Bar. He was going to make one more drift. And uh, Captain Zeke and I, we, we kept going home. Uh, he made that one drift. I guess what happened, one, one wave, you know, uh, tipped him up pretty far. And then before all the people slid to one side, then when the next wave come, 
that the boat couldn't right itself, it just tipped it right over. Oh, my. That's, that's, oh, that's my. what happened, yeah. yeah. Eddie? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was just too heavy on one yeah, side. Yeah, too yeah. heavy on mm. one side, yeah. Mm. A lot of and people got trapped underneath. It's terrible. Yeah. Some of them were picked up in the water, not too many. Uh, it was such a sad event. Yes, it was. One, uh, one case that I remember, one grandfather had his grandchild with him, and uh, not realizing, none of them realized this was going to happen. Uh, he, uh, for the safety of the grandchild, tied him to the rail so that he wouldn't fall overboard. There were quite a few lives lost there. I think there's only 19 saved, something like that. We were, a lot of folks went in and came out again to try to help. Yeah. I know Barbara Dorsbacker, who was a good friend of mine at the time, she was married to Dusty Dorsbacker. She helped Dusty pull with other boats, pull the boat back in, and on the boat there were several bodies. It was terrible. They had, uh, you know, all kinds of investigations, and that's when they started uh, putting a lot of laws down for the. Uh, uh, how many people you could carry and how much space you had to have for, mm -hmm. you know, different things and... Sure. Yeah, yeah. so... Safety well, rules, I guess you could call them, All kinds of safety yeah. rules started, yep. Yeah. This devastating event left 46 passengers dead. The Coast Guard investigation found that one of the Pelican's engines had failed, and this caused the already overloaded vessel to become more unbalanced. Though there were plenty of life vests on board, only one man chose to wear one. The catastrophe influenced Congress to amend the 1940 Motor Boat Regulations Act. And as a result, stricter inspection standards and regulations regarding the number of passengers on a given vessel changed industry standards. Now, we got the ambulance, not as a fire department thing, but as a gift from Russell McGrady after the Pelican disaster. It, it sometimes takes catastrophe like that to uh, convince people that we got to do something. So, well, Russ McGrady was a Chevrolet dealer. He got a Chevrolet station wagon and had it uh, extended out the back and a new door put on so that it opened sideways and you could put the dolly in and had it finished off with all the clamps and whatever other provisions uh, needed for an ambulance, the proper lighting, stuff like that. With a new emergency vehicle, the community was better prepared to deal with accidents and medical emergencies. In 1952, the ambulance squad was formed and summer resident and retired Surgeon General Norman T. Kirk volunteered to help teach first aid to the new squad. He was the one that gave us our initial training, and these were just firemen. And so he sent to the hospital, Water Reed Hospital, to send them two tapes of ambulance uh, training. You know, the, the Army had training. So the projector up there at, at the school was run by Kent and, and start this thing. And of course, it was all military stuff. And they show you the guy going out to pick up these fellas on the battlefield, you know, and so forth, and then show you his arm. And there was a hole where he was shot, and it was about the size of a dime with little blood running out of it, and so forth. And uh, then they turn it over and let you see the other side where the bullet Excellent. came out. <laughs> and the bone was visible. We would, we would lose half of the, the, the guys who wouldn't go to the ambulance. <laughs> Don't bring any more of those things or we won't have anybody. <laughs> yeah, really. The Montauk Fire Department was created in March of 1939. The outfit was entirely volunteer and men from all over the community participated. The department purchased two Dodge trucks and established itself in the old schoolhouse across from the railroad station. Though there was an occasional house fire by the early 1950s, brush fires and training occupied most of the department's time. They didn't have a real fire department here at first, um, but they did finally organize one. And uh, when I joined the first year, I thought, what kind of a fire department is it? We, nobody's house ever catches up. <laughs> and 
as a matter of fact, every spring we used to uh, send notices out to all the property owners and uh, tell them that the fire department would burn the uh, grass around their houses because people didn't have lawnmower companies you know, mm -hmm. take care of things. It, it, it was a tick control. And uh, so everybody was in favor. And then they would make a generous donation to the fire department. Taxes only paid for the operation of the trucks and so forth. But the New Year's Eve party. Yeah, <laughs> social <laughs> aspects of the fire department. Why we had to earn our own money. I went in in 1954. The fire department then would probably burn off of about 80 to 100 spots that people would call up. Would you have a? Could you burn off this piece? Could you burn off that piece? And I mean, pieces were like from from Mingo to Westlake Drive around Fairview. And the only house then was only the Fisher Estate. Carl Fisher's house, and we had that whole block. And we used to burn off from community church right on down to Ditch Plains. Take that whole thing, all in one shot. <laughs> was it done like the fire department did it for training purposes? We did it for training purposes. With, and people we did it for to training brush purposes. Their land. But then it was ticks. It was ticks. I mean, uh, all of a sudden we now have a lot of tick fever going around. Well, we always say, there's a few of us down the firehouse, we still talk over the old times and we just say that, <laughs> you know, they're just family of the ones we didn't get, but. Uh, <laughs> Though much of Montauk was rolling grasslands, pockets of development began to emerge. The shores along Lake Montauk were one such area as more boats flocked there for safe harbor. In January 1951, Robert Gosman Sr. petitioned the town of East Hampton to construct a pier and boat basin to meet the demand of growing numbers of fishing vessels. We had the first boat basin here. Now that is right at the entrance of the harbor practically, you know. And actually it wasn't a great, it was a hard place to dock because there's a fast tide in there. Sure. It was really something. And there was no channel there now where Westlake is, so you could walk practically from the dock to Star Island at low tide. Because that was all dredged, you know. You'd jump off, maybe there'd be little, one little patch of water that was uh, eight feet or so, but literally you could, you could see the seagulls standing in them. And then all the boats came out of Fort Pond and came to Montauk mm -hmm. Harbor. Uh -huh. they did, it saved them a lot of time going to fishing grounds because the boats were very slow, then they weren't these fast, speedy things that they have today. So that's how that commercial thing started down there. And then after that, then Tuma bought a piece, Durier bought a piece, Uline had a piece, you know. Mm -hmm. Derenberg. Derenberg, and then right around the corner. Completion of this new boat basin in 1952 made Gosman's dock and lunch counter a new central location for day trippers and commercial fishermen alike. These were guys that came out for the day. Right. They came out by bus and sometimes by train. And they would, um, you know, fish. In the early 50s. Yeah, and they had fishermen's buses that came out. Because remember, they used to come every, after we had the little lunch counter and bar. They had coffee and they had uh, clams and they had clam chowder and lobster roll. But that came later, the lobster roll. But they had hamburgers. Who thought about seafood? They were yeah. only on the shore, you know. <laughs> Who ate seafood here? <laughs> oh, we the fishermen that were poor, you know. And, and the people who appreciated it. And um, eventually we started to serve outside, which was my idea because I'd been in school in Switzerland. And, you know, sidewalk cafes all over the place. Everything was outside. And my God, they came from far and near by land, sea. <laughs> and both foot. It was incredible, incredible. By 1954, Montauk was becoming an increasingly popular beach resort. 
An August storm reminded visitors and residents that the ocean was not always the best place for rest and relaxation. The morning was gorgeous and I called, I called Perry at the, at the business and I said, when you come home for lunch, bring some fish so we can have for dinner. His answer was, he said, if I had any fish, they'd be flying. He said, what's the matter with you? We better hurry. <laughs> <laughs> such a beautiful day and I looked out the picture window and sure enough that wind was really blowing and as things turned out that was a severe hurricane and I remember Chip he said mom you look he said look at the water and at that point my house had so many leaps to it I thought he was talking about the water stripping from the ceiling which it certainly was and I said I know I know he said no mom you look out the window and that was when I saw that wave coming and I, from my picture window in Upper Shepherd's Neck there, which overlooked the ocean, looked out, I saw that huge tidal wave come up and go over the sand dunes and right across the highway, Route 27 going into the village, and right across what is now Kirk Park and right into Fort Pond and just keep right on going. And, and that's what separated Perry and his business and myself back at home with the children. And when the storm hit, we were all watching the uh, tremendous waves and this gigantic wind. And uh, when the wind started abating, uh, Joe and I got up on uh, the roof of the house to watch the ocean waves, which were absolutely tremendous, only to find that the wind had not in fact abated, that we had gone up in the eye of the storm. And suddenly it came back and we couldn't get off the roof, so we were lying there for an extended period of time, oh, holding yeah. on to the uh, air vents from the kitchen. And that was a, that, that was must have been terrifying. That was a scary, <laughs> yeah. that was definitely a, wow. a very frightening, you know, oh, wow. yeah. frightening event. Uh, and that was very, very impressive. I mean, in a big storm, you're, uh, you're fearful for your possessions and your people and all of that, but you're also in awe of what nature can do. It's, it's a very exciting thing to see. It really is. It certainly is. As in the 1938 hurricane, Montauk became an island as flooding occurred on Napeague and in the village center. Though the waters may have physically divided Montauk for several days, the community was united in October of 1954 when the Montauk Civic Association made a landmark decision. The listing in Kirk Park of the men of Montauk uh, are pretty much the men who were in the Civic Association. Kirk It was Norman Kirk, who had been the uh, Surgeon General of the United States Army. He also started the Montauk Civic Association because he wanted a flagpole in Montauk. And he wasn't interested in those dinky little flagpoles like we have in front of the library uh -huh. and so forth. He were that big thing there and so forth. And that thing almost got stuck in Riverhead because in those so days weird. you had to go oh, through right angle turn <laughs> there where the traffic light is uh -huh. in the very center of uh -huh. Riverhead and uh, to get around that curve, I mean, the front end turns and the back end turns. <laughs> but this, it was close to hitting the corner of that bank. <laughs> and anyway, they got it out here and they got it up. And I don't know, it's, it's almost as high as the seven story building. The Montauk Civic Association was formed in an effort to monitor the growth and beautification of the community of Montauk. Though the organization elevated spirits with the erection of the flagpole in October 1954, some of its other activities were not as well received. There were some people who had made efforts to do things like get uh, ugly signs down and things like that. One of them was, uh, was Norman Kirk and he and a, a couple of other fast-moving fellows decided that Montauk really looked terrible with all the signs and stuff, so they were they were kind of like um, 
not vigilante, but but in the dark of night they would knock signs down. <laughs> Make them very popular, and finally, finally, one of the one of the group came to us and said, <coughs> and said, you know, <coughs> maybe you maybe you women ought to take this over and see what you can do with it. And so that was the beginning of the Montauk Village Association. Montauk's growth throughout the early and mid 1950s caused some concern among longtime residents who realized it may end long-standing traditions. The cattle ranch is the oldest cattle ranch in the U.S. That's hard to believe. It is. But in the early days, <clears throat> from Patchog out, herders would drive their cattle out here in the spring, drive them back in the fall. They would summer out here in Montauk. Now, Montauk then was all grazing land. It was all grass. When you were young, was there any herding going on? Uh, yeah, we, uh, with Vin Dickinson, uh, we uh, used to drive cattle. In fact, uh, I was in on the last real cattle drive they had. They right. came in the railroad station and we drove them through. Right. Now we bring them out in trucks. The Dickinson family ran that show. Uh, the cattle used to come in from the Midwest on the Long Island Railroad and they would take them out of the cattle car and put them in a holding pen alongside the freight office. And then the next day, like early in the morning, six o'clock, we would get everybody together, ride down from the dude ranch and get the cows and then drive them up to the dude ranch. Uh, our route used to be, we would come in at the railroad station and leave there and then where West uh, Lakeside is, on Edgemere, we'd go through the hills and then come out on, uh, on uh, Essex and then head Essex down to 27 and then take 27 all the way up to the, the Dude Ranch. After the last cattle drive from the railroad station, local cowboys and girls needed to find new ways to recreate the past. As a result, the Deep Hollow Ranch, Wild West Horse Show, was born. Then we had the Horse Show, which was a big thing then. And we'd have probably 100, 150 horses, of, and they had different events for them. Craig Thomas. I, I used to work for uh, Finn as a uh, stable boy, I mean, when he yeah. first, he was on a uh, And he was a kid, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was riding the equipment race. They had to get on the horse bareback and ride bareback up to the other end of the ring. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the ring were the saddles. And then they had to take the saddle, put it on their horse, and ride back. First person to get back, of course, won the race. Mm -hmm. Craig Tuttle was riding a, a particularly crazy horse, and he didn't want to bother with cinching his saddle, so he just threw the saddle on and, and I think took a couple of turns around the horn, jumped on the thing. That didn't work. <laughs> well, the horse started to buck us, <laughs> even with sliding the dust. <laughs> yeah. The first horse I owned was Peter, but I called Peter the bad boy, and he was naughty. I can remember you and I used to what, ride in the quadrille, and the quadrille is a circular thing where you weave in and out. and. Uh, he had a distinction of knocking Shank Dickinson off his horse, and people, nobody knocked Dickinson off their horse. <laughs> Peter did. He just wouldn't behave, and he just got too close. And, and next thing I know, I look around, and Shank is on the ground. I thought, oh, oh, this is bad. This is really bad. <laughs> when we used to do the barrel racing, remember the straight barrels, and you oh, get yes. up to the top, and you turn around and come back. And, and Peter, well, he, he, he was fast, he was very fast, and very, he was a quarter horse, he was fast and quick. And when we got to the part where you're supposed to turn around and come back, he just kept on going straight. And I remember yelling, oh, damn it, and out loud. And my mother and father were there I'd watching this. And afterwards, she said, Betty, she said, do you know that you were swearing in public? I 
said, Mother, if you were riding that horse, you'd swear to it. Let me tell you. <laughs> I really didn't expect to be heard, but I was heard. <laughs> December 1957, construction on a new $500,000 airport in Montauk has been started on a 22-acre site. The airport is scheduled for completion next March and will shorten travel time from New York and make connections to New England. Since the announcement of the airport, Land sales in the area have soared to an all-time high, says Frank Tuma Jr., sales manager of Montauk Beach Company. The boom may also be attributed to the new Long Island Expressway to Riverhead, currently under construction. Montauk is having the greatest land sales since the late Carl G. Fisher. Builder of Miami Beach, Florida, came to Montauk in 1926. In the last five years, the price of oceanfront property has risen 500%, and other residential property has risen 300%. I was involved with the construction of the airport from day one. I don't know whether you've run the name or run across the name of High Sobolov. Mm -hmm rather close friends, and he said, Harry, you know, why don't we build an airport in Montana? Uh, in those days, uh, real estate was much cheaper than it. Well, now we can't even buy it. <laughs> so we bought that land and, and uh, went ahead with construction. And it's grown to what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very exciting uh, building that airport. Uh, the, the one thing they did down there that I was so opposed to, instead of uh, they had a lot of land, and they built a uh, what they called Sea and Sky Portel, yes. and it still exists. But they built it right at the end of the runway, uh, instead of off to the side. <laughs> I said to her, I said, that's really, you know... <laughs> it seems to me there was a sign in the bar that said, in case of engine failure, uh -huh. brakes are on the house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just about the time that the, the jet engine was starting to be used in, in aviation, we decided to have an air show. So you had like daredevils, uh, wing walkers, Oh yeah, all pretty stuff? girls walking on wings. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Aviatrixes up there. <laughs> yeah. in, in, inverted flying. Unbelievable. And, and, and a, a light plane that a, that a fellow would fly along and disappear behind the dune line. Everybody would scream, oh, he's crashed. Oh, and he'd go along, uh, so we'll say, three quarters of a mile about this far off the water. <laughs> then all of a sudden, come oh, back uh, uh, That was, uh, I think probably we had a guy jump out of an airplane in a parachute. Mm -hmm. And uh, all sorts of nonsensical things. In 1958, regular commercial air traffic was not the only addition to the Montauk sky as the Air Force's 773rd AC and W program at Camp Hero reached peak activity. The 773rd AC and W squadron stands for Aircraft Control and Warning. During the Cold War here, we operated 24 hours a day. There were approximately 200 to 250 men, and approximately 20 men and 20 officers at the radar site. Uh, their mission here was to direct identify, intercept, and destroy, if necessary, unknown aircraft or unfriendly aircraft. Uh, if we could not identify them, we would scramble fighters to go up and take a look at them, depending where the target would be. Because the fighter squadrons are along the entire East Coast, you may scramble somebody from POTUS up in the Boston area, out on Cape Cod, and they would scramble. They'd be off the ground in approximately three minutes. We'd send them out there could tell the height of the target with our height finder and of course the range and the asthma of it from your search radar. They'd go up, usually it would always be a flight of two. The first one would go in and ID the target and the other would maintain a, a separation in case it was an unfriendly target and he would be in a position to attack the target. 
whereas the one making the ID would be, he'd be more interested in trying to identify their threat. And of course, you always had rules of engagement. You never engaged anything until you had proper approval, etc. Also, sitting right off the coast of Montauk, where during those days, uh, Russian trawlers who were actually not doing much fishing, they were fishing to find out what type of communications we were using, what type of radar we had, and they could identify that by the radar uh, frequencies. I used to go down to West Hampton Beach to get my fly time, and uh, while I was there, we'd fly out, of course, to Montauk Point, and we'd take a good look at those Russian trawlers that were out there. And as they say, they weren't really fishing, they had it was just a, a small fishing boat that was full of antennas that were just spying on us. There was a similar sector in Boston, New York, and in Southern Virginia. And the, the, and the thing about it, if Boston's radar went down, we could overlap and they could, we could cover Boston if they had a problem, and conversely. But then it wasn't very long that those computers became completely outdated. Our computer probably was as big as this room. And uh, today, our capability, you could probably put a desk with, with the, with, based on what we had in those days. It was just early, early day computers. And by the time it became operational, it was already outdated. When I left here, I went to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, and they started a program which was called the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment System, the SAGE system. And they used all the radars, but there was, the information was automatically transmitted to McGuire Air Force Base, and they handled the, the defense of the East Coast from one particular site. So then these, these radar sites, they weren't actually doing the controlling from here. It was more of a relay, relaying the, the, the radar inputs to one central location. By 1959, technical advancements had rendered the radar site a relic of the 1950s. As a result of the decreasing performance of the site, the Air Force removed non-essential personnel from Montauk. Though military presence dissipated, Montauk's population continued to grow. The Montauk Beach Development Corporation completed construction of the Soundview Estates and the Oceanside Developments. By 1960, land sales continued to drive the price of property up. A message from the Montauk Chamber of Commerce. Montauk, the friendly community beyond the crowds, extends a most cordial welcome to you. It is the ardent wish of those of Montauk that others may enjoy the spectacular pleasantries that make it an ideal vacation community. Whether you wish to come for the day, a week, or as a permanent resident, you will find here a delightfully cool, pleasant vacation land. A place where you and your family will delight in resort living at its best.